Well, man, we all have questions that we don't like to ask, and so we ask for a friend, right? And so, and starting in January, we're going to be starting a series called Asking for a Friend, where we're going to be answering the tough questions that nobody likes to ask, like, why do bad things happen to good people? How come God doesn't answer my prayers? What does God think about sexuality? What happens in a politically divided nation? What's God have to say about that? So we're going to be diving into some stuff that I know a lot of you wrestle with, and it's okay to wrestle with those things. It's okay to have doubts and questions, and we're going to address those things according to the word of God. So make sure to be here January 5th. So pumped to start that series. Well, 2019 years ago, time was literally split in two, into a before and an after, and not something, but because of someone. The terms Anno Domini stands for AD, or AD stands for that, and There's also a BC, which we all know is before Christ. These are used to label the number of years in the Gregorian calendar and that this is the most widely used calendar in the world today. It was initiated in AD 525. And this term, Anno Domini, is a medieval Latin, which means in the year of the Lord, better known as in the year of our Lord. And this is based on this idea of Jesus' birth. That there was this moment, that there was this person that came into the world, and when he did, there was a before him and an after him. So much so that our calendars and our lives have revolved around this birth ever since. Luke gives an account of this historic event and begins to explain the story that most of us know of Mary and Joseph, and we know that she was a virgin, that God gave her the responsibility of bringing his son into the world that Joseph had to wrestle uh, with staying with his fiance. They, they stay together. And it says that Joseph uh, went up from his town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea, and they went to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, The time came for the baby to be born. This was the moment. Time became a before and after. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And we know this story, but tonight I maybe want to give you a different perspective to think about this, that our world revolves around time. It revolves around this calendar, this A.D. and B.C., and everything is structured. But but I want you to know this, that the Bible says that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. I think God knows what it's like to raise children, right? He just knows. Like That day was a thousand years, right? That that's what it is to God. To think about this, that God was before there was time. He is outside of time. He's outside of it. That Jesus was there. It says in the beginning that God was there, that Jesus was there, that the word of God became flesh in Jesus. And so the one who was outside of time stepped into time. And when the one who was outside of time stepped into time, time split in two. Matthew gives his account. He was quoting the prophet Isaiah who foretold of this many years before. It says, look, the virgin, Mary, will conceive child. She'll give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That God who was outside of time stepped into time. He became flesh and began to dwell among his people. You see, it wasn't just this birth, it wasn't the fact that that God was becoming flesh that caused this monumental moment in time, but it was also the message that this little boy was going to bring with him. In Luke 2, verse eight, he gives, goes on with this account and he says, and so when Jesus was born, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said this to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Look at your neighbor and say, Great news. I got great news. And it's going to bring you great joy. Look at him and say, Great joy for all people. Look at him and say, that means you. That means you. For all of us, there was good news that is going to bring us great joy. And when Jesus' birth was announced, it was described as just that. Good news. 
that will bring us all great joy. That Jesus was a messenger from God sent on a mission to bring all of us some good news. How many of you need some good news? How many of you like hearing good news? We all like to hear good news. When we hear news that's not good, we hope that that news is bad. That's not true, right? When we hear bad news, we go, oh my gosh, I hope that's not true. But when we hear good news, we go, oh my gosh, I hope that's true. I hope that is true. I hope this good news is true. We want it to be true. We hope that it's true. If you saw the headline that chocolate, iced, cream-filled long johns are nutritious and will help you lose weight, how many of you would say, praise God for that good news? I know I would. That's my favorite donut, so just put your favorite donut in there. If you found out your favorite donut was actually good for you and nutritious into your body and would help you lose weight, it would be good news. But just the fact that it sounds good doesn't mean that it's true, does it? In fact, we probably probably heard before, and, and oftentimes when we hear good news that seems too good to be true, we think just that. That sounds too good to be true. We're skeptical sometimes of good news because it seems too good to be true. But the one who was outside of time, he stepped into time, and he split time in two just to bring you some good news. I should write a poem with that, right? It's so rhythmic. Sounds great. Didn't even sound that good the first time I said it. But the gospel actually means good news. The gospel account of Jesus' life we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These were the accounts of Jesus' life. They're described as good news. They labeled this message that Jesus brought specifically as good news. And so if it's described as good news and we love good news and whenever we hear good news, we hope that the good news is true, why then are so many people pushing away the good news, rejecting this amazing news? Instead of leaning in, that's what we all want to do to good news. What are you saying? We lean in. We want to hear more. People are pushing away and pulling out. Why? I think it's because they've probably heard a version of Christianity. They've heard a version of the message of Jesus that's not true. That's inaccurate. And because of a certain experience and because of what someone told them or what someone did, because of an upbringing, they've bought in to a message, but that message is not the original message of Jesus. And it's not their fault, probably. And maybe tonight you're here and you're skeptical of the gospel and you're skeptical of Jesus and of Christians because of an experience and maybe all you've seen are the ones who pick it outside of things and all they talk about is what they stand against instead of what they stand for and so you've been turned off and turned away. If you go, if that's the good news, I don't want to hear it. But tonight I want to give you an accurate representation of Jesus' good news. I want to tell you his story and let you know that that good news is for you because I'm telling you, the original message of Jesus was good news. It was good, it was compelling, and when people heard it, they leaned in. They wanted to hear more. We gotta go a little bit further in Luke's gospel to really understand what this good news is. If we go all the way to the 16th chapter and the 16th verse, Luke says this, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets were your guides. He's speaking to people, to Jewish people who the, the law of the Old Testament is what gave them the opportunity to know God, to relate to God, to connect with God. That there was a very systematic things that they had to do and there was very religious things. Uh, rituals that, that they had to go through so that they could encounter God and only a select few could even enter into the presence of God and there was all these laws and things that they had to do to stay right with God and, and every year they would have to bring sacrifices of, of innocent animals to the Lord and, and present them because the wrath of God had to be poured out on something and so God set up this religious system and Luke says when until John the Baptist, that's all you guys know, but John the Baptist, as you know, he came before Jesus to pave the way for Jesus, saying there's a greater one coming, and he's coming with some good news. He goes on, he says, but now the good news, since Jesus has come, 
the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. And he says this, and everyone in that day and time to his first century audience was leaning in. They were eager, he said, to get in on the good news. Because when we hear good news, we want it to be true. The Jews needed this Old Testament law, but it wasn't going to be good for everyone. God knew he needed to make a way, and John the Baptist paved the way for this brand new message. It was new news. It was different. And Jesus enters the pages of history in bringing with him as a messenger the good news of the kingdom of God. So what does this good news mean for you? We need to know that Jesus was with God. That Jesus came as a representation of God. He came to show you what his father in heaven was like. In fact, many times Jesus would say things like, I don't do or say anything unless the father tells me to do it. I am him. I listen to him. I speak to you what he tells me to speak. And Jesus shows up and he says, this is how God views you now. You're a child of God. You're a son. You're a daughter. Jesus came knowing that he was going to make a way for you to view God differently. Jesus came teaching things and messages of saying, this is how we should treat one another. This is how the human race that God created should interact. And he says, and now because of what I'm going to do on the cross, you're going to be made right with God. That you're going to be righteous, not because of what you can do, but because of what Jesus was going to do for you. And then Jesus hung on a cross and gave his life for you. And gave us the gift of salvation that we're celebrating this Christmas. And this gift cost us nothing, but it cost him everything. And Jesus became that atoning sacrifice for all sin. You see, when those readers and those listeners heard this, they thought, this seems too good to be true. You mean, we don't have to do all of that? That that, that I can know God? That I don't... That I can experience the presence of God myself now. That I don't have to rely on a priest or someone else who's been selected. That I can know God. And so everyone was eager, Luke said, to get in on this good news. It was so good, it seemed too good to be true. But the fact was, is it was true. This good news was true. You see, the original version of the good news was compelling. It was good. It was so good that they began to talk about it. It was compelling and it was worth telling. You see, very few people in the first century ever had their stories told, right? To get your story, most people couldn't write, most of them couldn't read. And so to get your story told, to get it actually accounted, to have an account of your story, you would have to be wealthy enough to pay someone to write out your story. So you would dictate your life. You'd say, this is how I grew up, right? And how many of you know when you tell your own story, it's a lot better than it actually was? Right, so you would tell your story, and then they'd read it back to you. Be like, ah, why don't you take that part out? Actually, uh, why don't we replace that with this? This sounds a lot better. And that's how we got accounts of people's stories in the first century. But here's Jesus. He doesn't have any money, and his story is being told. And the fact that we even have an account of his story is is amazing in of itself, because Jesus was just this poor car- carpenter, and then he wasn't even there. When they wrote his story, he was already gone. And Luke starts his gospel in the first verse with this word, many. He says, many people have written accounts of this story. He says, my account's not the only one. There's many. There's probably more than what we even have in the gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the ones that survived and made it into the scripture. He says, many people had accounts of this. Many people had given an account to the good news. So we must ask, why did so many people try to document the life of a dead man who was a nobody from nowhere, who wasn't even around? He was only in the public eye for three years. He was a carpenter from lowly beginnings. Why were so many people giving their time and energy to give an account of this man's story? Let me tell you why. Because something significant and good happened. And when you have good news, you got to talk about the good news. You got to tell other people about this good news. It was so good that people wanted it to be true even before they were convinced it was. 
So Luke goes on, he says, so many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used eyewitness reports circulating among us from early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, Luke says. He's like, look, I got CSI on this story, guys. I dove in. I got some DNA stuff. I talked to everybody. No stone was left unturned. We talked to everybody who had an account, anybody who was left around, anybody who wanted to talk. We interviewed them. And everybody, we began to piece all the information together. And he's writing to a guy. Let's just call him Theo because his name's hard to say. Theophilus. Say Theophilus five times really fast. No, don't actually. But So he's writing to Theophilus and Theophilus had to be some wealthy man. We're not sure who he was, but he was wealthy enough to pay Luke to give an account, to write an account of Jesus' life. And so he says, we investigated, we talked to everybody. What he's saying, he's like, you're getting your money's worth here. I did my homework. And he says, I have also decided to write this account for you. He says, so you can be certain, in verse 4, of the truth of everything you were taught. So Theophilus was a Christian. He hires Luke to give an account of everything he's being taught. Luke puts the account together. He says, I'm not the only one. There's been many of them. And I'm telling you, this good news, Theophilus, that's changed your life from everything that we can tell and everyone we talk to is true. Can you believe it? I know it's too good to be true. But this is true. Everything you've been taught is true. And Luke had no idea that this writing 2,000 years ago would be entered into the scripture that we would have in the New Testament in one of the four accounts of Jesus' life. Luke tells his audience the truth from his own investigation from the way he saw it. And he said this truth was good. How good? Real good. Why? Because now you can ask God for forgiveness Regardless of where you come from, that's why we believe it. It's why we teach it. It's why we preach it. You don't have to belong before you can believe in God. You, don't have, you can belong before you believe. People think, I got to believe and I got to behave, then I can belong. We got it all backwards. This is the good news. You can belong even before you believe. You can have your doubts. You can have your questions about God. And come in January 5th, we're going to talk about all those things. That you can wrestle with this and God still gives grace. That God still lets you follow him even with your doubts and your questions. That this is the good news of the gospel for you and for me. That you can ask God for forgiveness tonight and he'll give it just like that. That's good news. And this news wasn't just good, it was brand new news. Again, the Old Testament, it didn't work that way. These people were going, what? This was a new system. It flipped the old religious system upside down. In fact, Jesus flipped it so upside down that the religious people of his day were losing their power and their money, and so they killed him. He flipped it. This good news means that now you can have direct access to God. You can know your heavenly Father, that the creation can know the creator And maybe you're here tonight and you've walked away from faith because somebody didn't tell you the real story of Jesus. You got a different version of that news. And tonight I'm here to tell you it wasn't true. Maybe it was a church, maybe it was a Christian that instead of pulling you in with the good news like Jesus did for his followers and listeners, it pushed you away. And I want to apologize on behalf of the Jesus I'm representing tonight for that. And if you've wandered away from the relationship that God wants to have with you, I hope tonight that you'll buy into the real version, to the original version of the good news that I'm representing to you. And you've probably heard this scripture before, but you got to hear it through this lens tonight that for God so loved the world, John 3, 16. God so loved you and me, the entire world, that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, it's what Luke said, wasn't it? Great news, good news of great joy for all people. John says it the same way, that whoever believes, believe, that's it. All you got to do is believe, put your faith in, trust in. You mean I don't have to do anything? 
I don't got to get rid of this stuff. I don't got to break this addiction. I ain't got to clean all this up. No, no, no. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You see, sin separates all of us from God. And that separation, if, if not bridged and not received Christ into our lives, we will spend eternity away from God. The reality of hell. But he says, look, you don't have to do that. If you'll just believe, you'll have eternal life. And then he goes on, he says, for God, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That Jesus didn't show up pointing a finger at you, saying, I am all good, you are all bad. Judging you, pointing a finger, this is where you fall short, this is where you messed up. He said, no, he didn't come to do that at all. He didn't come to judge. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save it through what he was going to do on the cross. And it says, and whoever believes in him will not be condemned. This was good news, friend, and I'm telling you, it's good news for you tonight too. It's the good news of the gospel because sin had separated all of us from God. We all identify as sinners and God made a way where there was no way. That's the bad news is that we're all sinners. That we all needed a savior. And this good news we're talking about tonight, God sent one. He sent Jesus for you, for all people. This good news means that regardless of where you are tonight, you can take a step of faith towards God. And the God of this universe, the God who is outside of time, will step into your life. And when he does, you'll be met with mercy and grace and forgiveness, regardless of how far you've wandered from him. Jesus said it himself in Luke 5.31, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, those who think they're right, those who think they can do it on their own. No, 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 no. I've come to call sinners to repent. So we all are sinners. Again, that's the bad news. But the good news is, is that a sinner can find a savior and all you have to do is repent. That means you begin to view the world differently. That you don't follow your own path and do your own thing, but you turn to God. You turn from your sin, you turn from your ways, and you turn towards God. And scripture is clear, the good news says when you turn to him, you're not gonna find judgment, you're not gonna find wrath, he's not gonna take his belt off and go, finally got you, no, no, no. He's gonna say, welcome home. You belong, you're in. Now we'll deal with the behavior stuff, but I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna empower you to change and to be who I've called you to be. And then God begins to change us, looks not from the outside in, but from the inside out. That your soul transforms. That's the good news. Because many of you in this room, I haven't got to meet you, but here's what I know about all of us. Everyone in this room has tried to change themselves and failed miserably. I know I have. That even as if we don't believe in God, that there's still kind of this standard that we hold ourselves accountable to of the good person we should try to be and yet we continually fall short of even our own standards much less God's and the good news is is that you don't have to try it on your own anymore that God wants to help you be who he's created you to be you see we needed a savior and God sent his son to be just that and the end of the story is foreshadowed from the very outset. In Luke chapter 2, 11, he goes on and he says, So today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's going to save you. And this Savior that's coming, he's the Messiah. He's the one. He's the one that's going to fulfill the Old Testament prophet Isaiah's words. And he is going to go to the cross for you. He's going to build a bridge. There's a gap from where you are and where God is. And the cross is going to bridge that gap. And Jesus came on a mission. And this personification of good, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, didn't come for his own good. He came for yours. And he came for mine. Jesus himself said that he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, nobody takes my life. I came here to give it. It's the whole reason I'm here. It's the gift of Christmas. Christmas and Easter are so connected. It's when God's people gather and celebrate his birth, and then they celebrate his death knowing that his death was going to be the thing that made a way for us to know God. 
And as the band comes and we close out, I think the Apostle Paul says it best in 2 Corinthians 5.17 as he describes this good news and what it means for you. He says this, this means this, the gospel, this is what the gospel means, that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That's what baptism is all about. When we're baptized in water, we bury our old self, we come up new in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And he says, you become a new person. We hear this term reborn, where we're born again. The old life is gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God. It's all a gift. It was freely given. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it. It was a gift who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given all of us this task of reconciling people to him, of, of, of telling the good news, of being good news spreaders to other people because people are desperate for good news. He says, for God was in Christ. He came. It was Emmanuel. God was in his son. He showed up reconciling the world to himself, not condemning us, no longer counting our sins against us. And he's given all of us this wonderful message, this good news of reconciliation that anyone who believes can be reconciled to their Father in heaven. You see, Jesus birth marked a new beginning. He who was outside of time stepped into time on a mission to redeem the lost back into relationship with their heavenly father. Jesus' birth marked a new beginning for all who would simply believe. That everyone's life could literally begin again. And the birth of this little boy made a way for all people, everyone, to be born into the kingdom of God.